Australia's oldest asylum. There's easier ways to get in here, but I just like the challenge. Don't let this video fool you. Gladesville Hospital, here in the heart of Sydney's inner west, is open to the public and it's an amazing place for young and old to explore. Opened in 1838, it was originally known as Tarbon Creek Lunatic Asylum and was the first purpose-built mental hospital by the banks of the beautiful Parramatta River. Governor Richard Burke reported back to England that nobody in New South Wales was qualified to run this new asylum and requested that a suitable married couple be sent out as superintendent and matron. Joseph Thomas Digby of St Luke's Lunatic Asylum in London and his wife Susanna made the voyage down under and took up residence at Tarbon Creek, which was back then only accessible by boat. The old Gladeshill Bridge, also called the Parramatta River Bridge, wouldn't open until 43 years later. The new bridge as we now know it is situated about 300 metres east of the original and was launched in the 60s. First patients transported were 39 women from Parramatta's infamous female factory, a grim workhouse for orphans and vulnerable women, plus 23 male convicts from Liverpool Asylum, which was a repurposed old courthouse. In those days, you didn't need to be seriously depressed or suffer psychosis to be sent to an asylum. Simply being aged, disabled or different could have you admitted here indefinitely. People could be labelled lunatics due to things like sunstroke, overwork, domestic trouble, religious excitement, love affairs and seduction, excessive sexual indulgence, which is some pretty serious slut shaming, and nostalgia, meaning I'd most definitely have been a lifelong resident here had I been born back in those days. Once a patient was admitted, their complaints about poor conditions and mistreatment were often used as further evidence of their insanity. For many, there was sadly no escape. Down here is where it gets really interesting. Come join me. In 1869, Tarbon Creek Asylum was renamed as Gladesville's Hospital for the Insane. And despite this now improper term, the focus became for patients to finally receive a better quality of care. Facilities were improved, so patients could enjoy recreational activities, including sports. The cricket pitch became, and still is, well known, with cricketing legend Sir Donald Bradman once causing quite the stir when he made an appearance at a social match held here in the 1930s. Gardening and agricultural activities became key components to this more modern, holistic approach to mental health treatment, and patients who showed even the slightest interest in work were given jobs on the grounds, the laundry and sewing room for ladies, and mechanical or farmhand duties for the men tending to the 50 cows, 300 pigs, hundreds of fowls, and handful of horses. A vineyard and market garden provided enough fruits to supply the whole establishment, and patients who developed trust with the wardens were allowed special luxuries for their cooperation, like beer and tobacco, which the New South Wales Health Department would be unlikely to provide today. Talk therapy plus exercise was now helping patients get well so they could eventually be reintegrated back into society. Now, if you've been watching this channel, you know I hate boats, but I actually have an aversion to many different types of water-based activities. And <laughs> this pool is so completely creepy to me, but I love visiting it. Now, there will be explorers way braver than I who would just be clambering at the fence here to try and get further and take better shots of this pool. And it, it would make for uh, amazing photos, but I can just feel my anxiety rising. Uh, even at this distance, um, a pool is, is something that will, that's going to go to rot very quickly without human intervention. So I can just imagine how polluted that water is. It, it looks quite frankly toxic, but it's a really beautiful backdrop. So I find it fascinating standing in this spot where 
world going on around you, but you're just standing in such a forgotten place. It just highlights to me how lost this place is in comparison. There's people kicking a ball down there. <laughs> it just makes it extra cute and quirky. At least there's proper barriers, so you know your dog's not gonna go jumping in there, thankfully. Unlike other Victorian-era asylums, notably its newer and more popular neighbour Callan Park in Roselle, Gladesville Hospital expanded over the years through the acquisition of nearby properties, so we can see buildings from a variety of different periods dotted around the complex, many of which are now heritage listed. Some are well maintained, while others lay in ruins, making this asylum a unique example of its time. The gorgeous gardens were actually designed by the same landscapers who created Sydney's iconic Royal Botanic Gardens, and you can still see many exotic species around the property mixed amongst the natives. Which brings us to arguably one of the rarest sites in all of Sydney, the Old Folly. Right up these stairs is my favourite part of this place. In the 1800s, a folly was a costly ornamental building which served no practical purpose, meaning it was made purely for people's enjoyment. They were often designed in a tower or more gothic style and built within large gardens and public parks. A folly's use was said to be secondary to its striking design, so they were created as a true visual treat back in Victorian times. These ruins once housed many kinds of exotic plants, and was the most extravagant part of the property. Wandering around in it must have provided so much enrichment to patients, an area where they could relax and reflect on life in this peaceful part of the property, which many visitors nowadays don't even spot. But that's not all. Beside the folly lies an old Italian-inspired grotto. This once regal-looking Roman-style water feature a sign of water therapy being used as a way of helping to heal patients. Although it appears forgotten, conservation works for the folly are in planning to preserve what's left of this exceptional structure, an important historical artefact. Now, this whole area has been called Bedlam Bay since the early 1800s an eerie nod to England's first lunatic asylum. But while one could easily assume this name is a reference to Tarbon Creek Asylum, this name actually predates it, and historians aren't exactly sure why. But it does stand to reason that this site was chosen by no accident. The convict-built Bedlam Point Wharf connected the old Punt Ferry from Abbotsford to Gladesville, and we can still see so much evidence of those convicts today. The wharf now hidden in the dense bushes, etched carvings and the hand-built rock walls still remain, a reminder to when this was the only way to get supplies over to Tarbon Creek Asylum. This charming little bushwalk alongside the water's edge leads you around the imposing perimeter fence and down to this secluded little bay where there was once a shark net making it safe for patients to swim. But while its future looks secure, we can't ignore its secret, dark past. Original conditions at Tarbon Creek were gloomy and prison-like. Patients included both convicts and free settlers, who were housed separately, with paid staff tending to the colonial inmates, while sane convicts were ordered to care for their fellow mad comrades. With mental illness being misunderstood and shameful at that time, many were shunned by their families, and New South Wales health records show that 1,200 inmates are buried in unmarked graves over on the northeastern corner of the site. 923 patients are listed on the death register, but the identities of those in the first 305 graves are lost if they were ever recorded. First Superintendent Digby immediately clashed with the asylum's construction plan. He wanted skylights installed to reduce the darkness in the corridors, more equipment and expenses, but his pleas to improve the inadequate facilities were ignored by the colonial authorities. His progressive London-learned approach embraced the idea that lunatics could change 
and learn to control their behaviour. And he was sceptical when it came to medicine-based treatments of the time, which often involved cruel and unusual punishments like isolation, bleeding, purging, being chained up and all kinds of abuse. Records cite patients being admitted and found to be perfectly sane, yet were still subjected to multiple rounds of electric shock therapy, which back then was called being put on the Bunurong, a reference to the old Bunurong power station in Matraville. A surgeon was dismissed after being caught smoking a cigarette while operating the electric shock therapy equipment, which even back then they knew was dangerous. In 1850, an inquiry was held over the deaths of two patients. In one case, a maniac inmate fractured the skull of another with a chamber pot, which, if your kids don't know, was a pot you kept under your bed at night to avoid having to use the outhouse. The man died of his injuries six weeks later. Another serious incident occurred in 1843, when it was discovered two of the male convict keepers were sexually abusing female patients, which resulted in those keepers being jailed on Cockatoo Island. The Newcastle Herald 1884 reveals a patient who was also employed as the cook's assistant committed suicide by cutting his own throat. The Australian People Newsletter, 1907, reported, While the lunatic class are a difficult kind of sufferer to handle, there is evidence of innumerable instances of cruel and improper treatment of the afflicted. There are fears many kept in asylums would be out, but for the source of income they are to the system. There must be an inquiry sooner or later, and Gladesville should be the first one looked into. Digby coped with many problems due to government cost-cutting especially when it came to overcrowding. By 1844, there were 148 inmates when the building was only meant to house 60. Not to mention the many children who also lived here while their mothers recuperated. Digby did what he could with this limited funding, making a modest library and daily newspapers available. It was observed that patients seemed to take great pleasure in reading. Quieter patients were allowed to fish, row, and sail under strict supervision, of course. On occasions, he chaperoned patients into Old Sydney Town, allowing them to explore the city for a treat. Now, Digby had worked at St Luke's Hospital for Lunatics in London and had come highly endorsed by his seniors. He was on a generous annual salary of £300, in comparison to the cook, who only earned £20 a year, which afforded him and Susanna an enviable lifestyle mixing amongst Sydney's elite. They regularly rubbed shoulders with socialites, business powerhouses and politicians of the time. But with his requests for improvements to the inadequate living conditions continually denied by government, this constant opposition ruffled the wrong feathers and in 1847 a heated committee meeting was held into the couple's conduct. Digby was demoted to the lowlier groundskeeper position with the excuse given that only a certified doctor was capable of managing the superintendent role. Susanna stood accused of being drunk while on duty as matron. Digby defended his wife, giving evidence that she had fallen off a horse three years prior and suffered from, quote, an aberration of intellect, which, to a stranger, may have given the appearance of intoxication. Several staff members supported Susanna, providing statements that they'd never seen her drinking before. Although she was in the clear, Susanna, still quite sickly, resigned as matron. Digby decided to stay on, but was viciously assaulted by an inmate, being punched to the ground, then kicked repeatedly. Afterwards, he was thought to be dead, and the Sydney Morning Herald incorrectly reported, We announce with great regret that Mr Joseph Thomas Digby, Superintendent of the Lunatic Asylum, Tarbon Creek, was most inhumanely murdered yesterday morning by a convict named Edward Marr. While Digby clung to life, the media relayed that he was not expected to survive from one moment to another. The accused inmate defended himself, saying, quote, He experienced great provocation from Mr Digby, who repeatedly called him an Irish convict and other similar slurs. He argued that Mr Digby displayed much prejudice against servants who were Irishmen, and on the occasion in question, used a good deal of abusive language towards the prisoner, had seized him by the collar, 
and violently shaken him. The jury eventually found the Irish convict guilty of the lesser offence of common assault, which to true crime fans should come as no surprise, as Australia is notorious for our lenient sentencing when it comes to criminals. But don't feel sorry for Digby. After he was dismissed, he struck it big in the gold rush and returned to England with almost £5,000, the equivalent to around $4 million today. Notable escapes include one lunatic last seen galloping along on a horse towards Bankstown, another captured only after they were spotted by a local resident running nude along the shore, and a patient caused a sensation after swimming away from his keeper into the notoriously shark-infested river. Described as a splendid swimmer, he luckily became terribly excited at the sight of a young lady on a passing steamer boat, which led to his safe return. The Town and Country Journal, 1895, really captures the essence of Gladesville Asylum, reading, If the whole of the environs of Sydney had been searched and researched for an important public institution, a more beautiful and appropriate one could not have been found than that occupied by the Asylum for the Insane at Gladesville. This is truly one of Sydney's most underrated places to visit and we hope you've enjoyed this virtual journey together back in time. Subscribe now to catch more adventures and maybe see you on the next one. Peace out.